It's Monday Live again. again. Back on the couch. Cheers, Marika. Cheers. I like the couch days. I do, too. It's so just, comfortable. Just hanging out. Hi, folks. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome to another Monday night with, uh, well, at least one of the hermits and Marika. Hermits and whatever I am. Yeah. Marika. Marika. I'm Marika. <laughs> you're, you're an honorary hermit. How's that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we have some interesting things to talk about tonight. We should, we should cover some of the basics before we get into the show. Um, if you are underneath me on YouTube, right down here, there's a subscribe button. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. It's a little bell. Uh, it, no, on YouTube, it just says it's subscribe. It's oh, a it bell does. on oh. Facebook. So if you, it's a bell on Facebook. So if you're watching us on Facebook and there's a little bell on the screen, Hit that bell, and it will uh, it'll subscribe you to our Facebook channel. If you subscribe to our YouTube or Facebook channel, every time we go live, which is almost every Monday, like almost we, every we Monday, miss a couple we miss here and there. Just one, I think. Just one over Maybe the course of two one, years, over two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah, which is pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. So every Monday night at five thirty, we uh, regale you with stories and conversations about wine. And on occasion, we'll be uh, introducing you to other people in the industry or, or uh, visiting uh, local visiting, businesses, visiting yeah. places we source our food from, or yeah. whether ingredients for the wine or things used at our restaurant. We'll have our chef on soon. We we're just mm -hmm. talking about getting uh, Chef Travis to uh, come and share some of his new specials and, and uh, things that he's creating. And, uh, you know, I hear the uh, background. We're going to be playing this later, but I don't think we should be playing it right now. It's kind of distracting. Oh, that's not, I wonder. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Technology. We'll get this down eventually. We've only been doing this for two and a half years. Yeah, it's just two and a half years. There's a big learning curve here, <laughs> for sure. Well, so, I, there was a period at one point, I, a little while into it, that I felt like every single week you were adding some new new microphone or new light or new yes, plug-in. Yes, there was. There was a period <laughs> there where it was getting more complicated. And we sort of settled into a pretty good setup, and now we've pretty much got it down, but then... Somehow we still we still, we still have things. Well, sometimes we move over to yeah. the couch and different setups, and we're missing somebody. Like today, we're missing missing well, Ken. He's, Ken and Chuck. But yeah, Ken Ken's has, down visiting Ken his has family. tuned in. He's down in Nashville oh, visiting. Oh, good. Visiting Hi, the wee ones. Who is grandson is already a year old. I know. So which, I know. Uh, surprises me, but um, and where's do we know where Chuck is this week? I don't. Uh, he was heading to Frankfurt last I knew, and then he, although he said something about being canceled, so I'm not sure. He's flying yeah, around the world flying somewhere. Around somewhere. So uh, so anyway, subscribe to our channels. Uh, you'll you'll get to to hear our stories, and occasionally we'll go live from other spontaneous locations, ski slopes, and Narragansett Bay, and whoever knows what else we'll You're do. There and everywhere. And uh, if you are watching the show with us today and you have any questions for us live, just type the questions in the comment section and we'll, uh, we'll answer them on the show if we can. And uh, if we can't answer them on the show, we'll try and get to them after the show so you yep. get your answers. And, uh, and that way we'll know you're watching and we'll be able to uh, have a broader conversation with you. And uh, if you like our broadcast, share it with your friends. If you think you know people that will enjoy it, that will be helpful. We're trying to do what we can to, to grow our audience and get more people interested in the, in the topics that we're talking about. So, uh, so I think that covers all the basics, right? Yeah, I think so. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about a few different things. So it's, well, it's been a busy weekend here at the winery. As many of our, our usual listeners know, um, it's our club release weekend. So we released our fall wines to the, to the club members this weekend, which means we had a lot of people coming in to pick up over the weekend. And we'll have a lot of people coming over the next few weeks to pick up their wines. Elise and I were down in the winery for a couple hours today, and she's actually still down there right now packing up 
the shipping boxes. So those will ship out tomorrow. So many of you may not have received your wines yet, but if you did right. receive your wines already, then you probably know uh, that you got a book that describes the wines that we're offering for our release uh, in great detail. Um, the, every book includes a letter, a welcoming letter that, uh, that we want to write to our club members, uh, telling you a little bit about the, the release and, uh, and the story that we're going to tell you in our book. And so we have uh, a few different wines. We have six wines in the release, all described in detail here. And we and will, I've been, I've been passing out little invites if you've been picking up um, in person in the winery, but um, for those of you maybe that haven't picked up yet or maybe missed that little card, in two weeks from today on November 7th, um, Ken will definitely be here and we're going to be tasting our way through the six club wines that night as our Facebook Live. So that will be a particularly good time for club members to tune in, whether at 5.30 or you know, later on in the, in the day if you can't tune Excellent. in then. Excellent. Um, so I'm looking gonna, forward to that. Yes, yeah, so we're going to taste the six wines, yeah. six bottles. That's a lot of wine. <laughs> it is. And of it's course, at home, you don't have to open all six bottles or invite some friends over and open them up, or at least you can listen in and get some extra tidbits from Ken and us and until so you'll know for when you do open the bottles. So Excellent. Maybe you can open one or two that night yeah. and share them with us and uh, talk about them with us on the, on the comment section. Um, but if you did get your club book already, you know that the story that we wrote about this uh, and this issue is our music menu. And, uh, and a lot of it is about uh, really speaking to my roots in the world of music where, where music uh, started really, where, where I began to take an interest in music when I was, when I was young and, and how music has shaped my life over the last 50 some years. So, um, so you have the story if you have the book and you can read all about it, but I thought we'd spend some time today talking about uh, some of the things that I wrote about here in this, uh, in this book. And we have some pictures to share and we have some, some live video to share of, uh, of some of the shows that we've, that we've had here in the loft. Uh, but I want to start sort of, I like to tell stories starting from the middle a lot. And I'm going to do that so again. Start in the middle and then bounce back to the beginning yeah. and kind of work your way back up. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, and the middle of this story really is about 11 years ago, uh, actually right around the time that the winery started. That was, yeah, 11 years ago. Yeah, it was. It might have been you a little tell, before it started. Story. I'm just going to enjoy some. You have cheese. some. Oh, yeah. oh yes. Well, before back. I tell the story, look at some of these. <laughs> look at some, some of these wonderful things. cheeses. Travis is uh, showing off some new stuff. I don't know if you can okay. see that, but uh, we have a, a a new sheep aged cheese that we're going to mm. be having on boards, and uh, and this is a new cheese out of Vermont. Do yeah, it's, it's it? from Vermont Farm said it's their Vermont Farm said cheddar, but this one has been aged with uh, fat tire beer, which I believe is actually a Colorado beer. Beer aged cheddar. Beer aged cheddar. It's but we've got in a couple different ones. We have um, the uh, the fat tire we got and the sip of sunshine from Lawson's, which is a Vermont beer. It, yeah. We have a sip of sunshine beer aged cheddar as well. Oh, so nice. That's great. And then we've got a Jasper Hill, a new brie. Everything's a little better with, with beer, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and a new Fortuna salami that's uh, the pistachio one, which I know I've tasted that before. She sent a sample of that once a year or so ago. When yes, you, when, when we did when the you show. visited her. We yes. brought some of that back. And yeah. that was a really good one. So I'm glad Travis has added that to our lineup. Excellent. Yeah, always, always good. Travis makes us a nice, uh, nice treat for mm -hmm. our shows. So, uh, so anyway. So, yeah, back to your story. So back to my story. So, so around the time when the winery was opening, um, a gentleman named John Lorenz, who was running a program called New Hampshire Jazz, uh, started the New Hampshire Jazz series, which was a, a listening room series held at three different venues around the state of New Hampshire originally. He had a venue down in, uh, I believe it was in Concord. He had a venue in, in uh, Laconia, Pittman's Freight Room, mm -hmm. and he was working with uh, the, the press room down in, in Portsmouth. Um, but the, the local venue was how I got to know John. Um, and if you're not familiar with the listening room, and, and you probably are if you're watching us today and you've been, been in touch with us for a while, because we talk a lot about listening rooms and we've been talking a lot about our listening room series here. But if you are new to the show and you're not familiar with what a listening room is, it's, it's a music venue where the, the audience is encouraged to remain quiet while the musicians play. Um, people who are who go to uh, symphonies 
are more familiar with that concept. Um, but when you go to see live bands, typically uh, that's not the case. It's not a listening room environment. There's usually a lot of talking going on. And the musicians are competing with the, the audience. And very often the solution to that is the musicians just turn their music up louder and louder until they make sure that they play louder than the audience. And then, and then the audience talks louder and then they turn off their music. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a competition. But the musicians, musicians ultimately will win that. But what happens is you end up with a very loud concert. And, uh, and not everybody wants to hear concerts at that volume. So, mm -hmm. so listening rooms were a really unique and special way for musicians and audiences to come together. And I had an epiphany this, this week, actually. Um, we had one of the largest uh, tasting, loft tasting experiences that we've had in this room the other day. We had 32 people on Saturday and I was doing my presentation to 32 people and not always, uh, the audience is not always quiet during this presentation. People come sometimes and they want to have fun and they're, and the audience is chatting during my presentation. And and that can be very distracting as a presenter when, when half the audience or a portion of the audience is is paying attention to themselves and not paying attention to the presentation. And I was really blessed to have 32 people who really wanted to hear the presentation and we had a very quiet audience. And what I found was my presentation got better. It was one of the best presentations on Saturday that I've ever given because I, the audience was, was paying attention. I was connecting with them. When I looked out into the audience, I got somebody's eye contact and I realized that they were listening caring about and paying attention to what I was saying, which made me all the more interested in what in, in conveying my story in a more meaningful and, and, uh, and loving way. And so it, it reminded me of what it must be like for a musician who's playing music on a stage and they look out into an audience that's wrapped in their, in their music, that's paying attention, that's attentive, that's, that's concentrating on the music. That must feel great for the musician in the oh, same yeah. way that it really felt good for me. Versus, yeah, if you're you're playing, you're pour, putting your heart into the music when you look out and somebody's not paying attention, pay, paying attention to the person next to them. They're paying attention to their food. Right. They're they're walking around. Right. Yeah, and they're exactly. It seems you're like they, they don't care. Your heart in, imagine the opposite, the extreme opposite. Imagine if you were on stage playing and you looked out into the audience and nobody in the audience was paying attention. It and that's, be that and that's what it's like for a lot of musicians most of the time. And they play at a play at a bar or play somewhere. It's it's just background yeah. for a lot of the people yeah. there. And sometimes they sort of are expecting it. But even if you're expecting it, it's it can't feel great. It's challenging. Yeah. I know a lot of musicians and I know that uh, many of them speak about that, that it's that it can be hard and you really have to adjust to it. Um, so. So a listening room is a unique and a really special way to listen to music. And so John put on a listening room series at Pittman's Freight Room back in 2010 or 11. And I attended a couple shows and I was blown away. I was absolutely blown away. I'd never been in that kind of an environment before and been able to listen to and appreciate music with that kind of intensity uh, in any other venue before. And I was immediately hooked and tried to go to every listening room show that, that John put on at the, at the Pittman's Freight Room uh, to hear every artist. And I didn't know, I don't think I knew any of the artists. They were all just talented people that John brought to the stage. And I began to trust that whoever John brought to the stage, it was gonna be an amazing show because he, he, he knew a lot of talented musicians. And so this went on for a couple of years. It actually transitioned to another venue for a year. He, he played at the Margate for a while. And, and uh, during that time, I got, got to know John. I, I offered to help in any way I could to help him, help him grow that, that uh, venue and grow his audience and help him on social media. And I did some photography. And we did some wine tasting when he was at the Margate. We used to bring our wines and do some wine okay. sampling to help grow the audience there and make our wine available to the customers. Well, lo and behold, after about two years, uh, John, John ran out of steam. And largely because the venues that he was working with were not his. And they didn't envision music uh, or the listening room experience like John did. And eventually John and the, and the owners of those venues went their separate ways and, and, uh, and, the, and John wasn't able to continue. It's very sad. Um, I really missed those days. But I stayed in touch with John and we became good friends. And uh, occasionally I would have opportunities to, to, uh, to attend, attend other shows. There is a there's another venue in the area. I don't know if anybody uh, knows about uh, the Purple Pit. 
we've talked about, talked about that it's before. one over in um bristol right yes and it's it's not as pure of a listening room concept as maybe john was trying to accomplish at Pittman's. it was pretty darn close it's a very small venue very talented musicians play there i think it holds about 40 people inside their their mm -hmm. uh their venue and they serve food and drink and it's it's a great place to, to see beautiful music and most of the time see it in a, in a listening room environment. And so occasionally we would, we would attend shows at Pittman's and uh, I mean at uh, the Purple Pit uh, to get my listening room fix. <laughs> but around 2000, 2017, we, we began to wonder what we would do with our third floor here. You remember what it was like back then. I do. This was a, like an 80s law office. It was six different spaces. Yeah, it was, a, it was yeah, kind of a weird setup, I guess. Yes, wretched carpet. Very, uh, very tan. Yes, and stained and dirty because it had been unused for so long. And we were just using it as, as storage. storage, mostly. That There was office space in the back, but it was also just a lot of storage and Ken's ping pong table. And a foos, I think there was, was the, a foosball table. That was table. the one thing I, I do miss. We yeah. had the foosball table and the ping pong foosball table. Foosball and so ping pong. When we had little breaks here at the winery or after work, we could come on up here and play some games of yep. pinball together or ping pong together. That was a lot of fun. But but uh, it was really poor use of space from a business perspective. We yep. had about 1,800 square feet of space that was almost completely useless uh, with the exception of, of a little bit of storage and, and uh, some, some fun and games once in a while. So we knew we needed to do something with this space. It was too valuable to let it go. And at one point we talked about the, the, the wine tasting experience moving up here and turning the downstairs into a, a restaurant and a retail outlet entirely and not have the tasting uh, down there. And we realized kind of what we do now that we were, we're, we're too much of a winery. We want the, to the tasting that. to be front and center. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So, it didn't make any sense to do that. And then this was too big of a space at the time to try and move everything up here and put a kitchen up here. It didn't make sense for, for the scale wise to do that. And then it dawned on me one day, what if this space was that music venue that I had been talking about and that I'd learned about through John? What if we created a listening room up here? And uh, it didn't take much convincing with Ken and Chuck uh, being also enthusiasts of really great music and the three of us having opportunities to see great, great shows on numerous occasions. Um, as soon as I started talking about the concept of putting a stage up here and bringing live music to the area, uh, it, it, it took off. And uh, we all three became very enthusiastic about the concept. And, uh, and we know it could, we could build it and it could be more than just that. It would, it would be other things as well as it has become, but, um, but it, really, it, it, it really got us excited. And uh, so we started envisioning it in 2017. We began thinking really in earnest about designing it and, uh, and raising the funds to, to build this project out by 2018, beginning in 19. And in 2019, we convinced the bank to give us enough money to, to do a construction loan. We found uh, a, a builder, Kurt, uh, Kurt Clausen, uh, Custom, Custom Homes. And, and uh, we scheduled the, the, the build out to begin in the beginning of 2020. And, uh, and well, we all know what happened then, right? 2000, Which, uh, March of I, 2020. I do remember though that being in some ways, good timing for certain things. It definitely, it slowed things down in terms of, you know, some production things and there were supply chain issues and all sorts of things that COVID made it difficult. But in other ways, I remember it was kind of a blessing because we would have probably had to shut down for a little bit of the construction time anyway, That's because exactly of so right. much, you know, there's, it was, it's a big project. So we couldn't be operating fully downstairs during right. it so the fact that we were closed actually worked out pretty well they had you know three months of uninterrupted work time it which it worked out good. in <laughs> some way almost miraculously because construction was supposed to begin here in october or november of 2019 and it didn't and it was very frustrating you can imagine we kept being told it's going to start it's going to start we're going to get the crew there we're going to get the crew there and it kept being delayed and delayed and delayed 
and it was very frustrating. Yeah. They didn't actually begin construction till the very beginning of March, and on March 17th, we had to close because of the pandemic. So had they started, think about the scenarios, had yeah. they started in October, what we learned shortly after they started the project was there was some structural issues with the building that meant we were going to have to engage in far more major structural change, which meant that the tasting room ultimately had to be closed for probably would have been at least six weeks. To and get that would that have work been done. in yeah fall 2019, which we would have been well, close for six weeks in, in October and yeah, November. Which, well, that's not our most quiet time or our most busy or most quiet time of year. It's still quite a lot of traffic in October. A lot of traffic. And what would our staff have done? Where would our staff have have earned a living while we were closed? Yep. Um, we couldn't have afforded to pay all of our employees to work for six weeks without having having any revenue come in. It would have been a major 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 disruption. Yeah. And and so not only was the delaying of the project turned out to be serendipitous, the fact that we had to, uh, we had to close for other reasons allowed the project to get uh, fully underway through March and April. And, uh, and during that time, because of the pandemic relief, our employees were able to collect unemployment. Yep. And so it was so serendipitous in so many ways. Uh, it, was, it, it was really uh, amazing how it all ended up working out. And... Uh, it did take again longer than we had hoped. We had this had originally been projected to be a four to six month project, more like twelve to fourteen months was the was the ultimate uh, uh, time frame. But yep. as with everything we've learned when we've built this winery, is that time was useful. We we had the opportunity to learn lots of things as we were as we were taking the time to to build the space out. We were uh, learning a bunch about about uh, better ways to approach the problem, better ways to build the space, um, all kinds of things that were ultimately yeah. to our advantage for, uh, for taking extra time. So it worked out great. We, yeah. we actually finished this space, as you all know, sometime in May of 2021. Yep. And then we worked with uh, uh, a, sound, uh, a sound and lighting company down in uh, the seacoast. Um, I'm drawing a blank on their name. It's John. John Coretto is the owner of the company, um, and he spent the next six months or so building out our our sound system and the lighting system, so that when we do fi did finally get a stage program going, we we uh, we had the right sound and lighting. And that was another sort of serendipitous thing. It really didn't make sense to get a to get a concert series going in 21 and, and wow. early 22 COVID was too much of an, of an issue. Still. Unpredictable. And we were still, we had just opened the space. So we had all that time to learn the space. We did some events. We did some tasting things up here. And I think you started the lift, listen, not the listening room, the, um, the loft wine tasting experience pretty soon after we opened up here. Right. Yes. yes. That was going most of all last yeah. summer. So we were able to get a sense for the space and, understand it a little more before diving into what it was sort of built for. Right. And that, right. Was, that was really good for us, I think. So as always, we say this a lot, the time it's taken us to build the things that we've built here have ultimately served us really well. We've mm -hmm. learned a lot and we've, we've uh, uh, been able to really uh, make improvements on our plans and ideas because of taking the time to do it. So I always say that's any new business uh, because of that. You know, take your time and don't push it because rushing it, you're just going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You just will make mistakes. Why don't we check in with the audience yeah. to see if anybody's, we've been just chatting here mm -hmm. and uh, we haven't taken any questions. We see what so we do have um, our usuals have joined us and a few others. It looks like Priscilla, Janice, Christine, Gary, Matt and Lynn are on, Karen Vecchio is on, lots of, lots of our usuals and they've shared some of what they're drinking. We've got Janice has some petite blue, Christine Excellent. has crab apple. Matt is I following Jess lead, also Petit Blue, needs more Red Scare. That's what I've got in my glass. Oh, you're going to make Matt jealous. Sorry, Matt. Um, yeah, talking a little, yeah, some comments about the pandemic. Gary said, yeah, just the world changed and how, yeah, Matt and Lynn were, were great about, uh, they, they ordered a lot of wine that early in the pandemic from us and from their other favorite yeah, wine. Matt and Lynn and, and all of our club members and, and many of our customers that weren't club members really came through for us. Yeah, I remember seeing it, some pictures from you, you know, I was I was at home 
hanging out. And I think you and Ken were working as hard or harder than you always do, loading up every day all those boxes and having to drive them over to the UPS or the shipping store. Yeah, it's in town. curbside pickup. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, anytime anybody called and wanted to come pick wine up, I would come on up yep. and, and uh, bring the wine out to the curb. Yeah, so it was definitely busy. And yeah, we probably wouldn't have made it through without all that support during that time. Um, Matt asks, yeah, at what point did you buy the piano? Good question. That was that was early on, didn't you? Yeah, we actually bought that. Believe it or not, we bought that piano in <laughs> that October. That was first. <laughs> it was first October of 2019, before a single nail had been pounded or actually removed, before any construction had begun. Um, and that's a, that's a good story. I'm glad you brought it up because I think it's important. Um, one of the things that... So, I, 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 I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, during this pre-construction time, I, I spent many hours with John Lorenz. Um, he, he volunteered to, to help us build and shape this, this venue. In fact, not volunteered, we, we actually paid him as a consultant to, to help do it. And, uh, and he was instrumental in, in many of the aspects that came to life to make this space what it is. He helped design where the stage went. He helped think about the, the sound and the lighting equipment that we needed. And, uh, and one of the most important things that John contributed was the concept of the piano. So we, early on, we decided if we're going to do a listening room, it really would, especially if we want to have jazz up here, that having a, a decent piano would be critical to, to this venue. It's not the same thing people can, can bring. Well, it's, it's really Unless hard to, you are, what, what's the name of the... Oh, you knew you were going to say that. Played the, the gentleman who played down, down in, in Portsmouth. Uh, Portsmouth. Um, he uh, he had his uh, yeah, sort of his twelve renowned. foot grand piano delivered to the Jimmy's uh, Jazz Club down in Portsmouth, and they had to remove the second floor window and crane the piano in. Yeah, yes. so because he could only play on his he piano. He would only play his piano. Yeah, which is, I can't even imagine that. But yeah, we didn't want to be craning any pianos in no, here. So. so we wanted to get a great instrument and. So John, John really said, he said, if you're going to spend money on a, on a piano, you need, a, you need to spend every penny that you can afford. You really need to get a decent piano. There's far too many places where artists show up and they have to play an out-of-tune, uh, older piano that doesn't have good action, that doesn't have the, the quality sound that it, that it should have. And for accomplished piano players, um, that's sort of a slap in the face to ask them to play a, an under-par instrument. And... So John did some research and talked to many pianists, jazz pianists all over the area and, I mean, and through his friends and contacts in New York and Boston. And it was determined that a, that a Yamaha C3 was, was damn near one of the best instruments that you could get uh, and satisfy the, the jazz audience anyway. And so we began looking for a piano. And John and I and Tom Robinson, who's played here before, another accomplished pianist, uh, went down to Daryl's Music Hall in October 2019, and we literally spent the day at Daryl's Music Hall. All day. Such a great it was day. four or five hours. They have, they, I think at the time, there must have been 50 pianos in that, in that space. Hard to imagine 50 pianos. They were jammed in. Every inch of the place was taken up with pianos. And they had a basement where they had some pianos down there. They had a 12-foot grand piano that was often rented out to the Verizon Center for some of the oh, big yeah. artists that mm -hmm. play there. And, uh, and John and Tom got the opportunity to play just about every instrument in that place. And one of the instruments was this, this uh, newly refurbished 2000, uh, uh, 1999 uh, Yamaha C3 piano. And we played every instrument, we played a brand new C3 piano. A brand new C3 piano sells for something like $60,000. It's a really nice instrument. We played that brand new C3 right next to this one. And believe it or not, all three of us felt like this instrument actually sounded better. And some of that is, you know, instruments need to be broken in. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, clearly that, that brand new C3 would have been a very nice investment, but it would have taken time to really, you know, work its way yeah. into having that special sound. Whereas this one has had 20 years of playing in it. But had been kept well and... It was a and concert actually, grand pianist who, who owned it. Yep. It was their home piano where they practiced. And it was kept, it's in brilliant shape. Yeah. 
Um, we tried electric pianos. We tried some other brands. We tried some of the prosumer brands. There was a prosumer Yamaha C3 brand new that was about $17,000, uh, right in the price range of what we ended up paying for this one. Um, and it was night and day listening to the, to, so the prosumer model played next to this one. It was night and day. And, and all of us, by the end of the day, we agreed unanimously that there was, there was no better piano in that store for what we needed than this piano. We bought it on the spot. We, uh, Daryl's Music Hall agreed to store it because we knew we were going to be at least a few months away from yep. being able to move it up here. A few months. It was a year and a half. Daryl's Music Hall, cheers to them. This Music Hall Thanks, stored Daryl. that piano at no cost wow. for a year and a half. Have we offered them some free loft tickets since then? We should. Uh, you know, it's a good, it's a good point. I think, I think I will do that. I certainly <laughs> I did, did uh, certainly let Adam Daryl, who was yeah. the, the gentleman that, that helped us, I did mention that he should come and see a show, I'm sure, and invited him, but uh, it's been a while, so I should sort of ask him again. But, um, excuse me, they, uh, they were wonderful. If you want to buy a piano, uh, you, should, you should see Daryl, Adam Daryl down at Mer Daryl's Music Halls. Great people, sure really I great people have memory of it but i i know the name daryl as well enough that that must have been where my family bought our we had a baby grand at our house it's the largest we must, we must have bought our piano from them um but i was young enough i don't i don't remember going and testing out pianos there or anything but it's by far the largest piano dealer in initially. in the state yeah and i think there's one other dealer much smaller but they're, they're the go-to in new hampshire yeah. anyway and, and i really i highly highly recommend them they're great so we have we have a really an outstanding piano and people, pianists. The reason that we put the good piano up here is John told me if you put a good piano up there, pianists all over New England are gonna wanna come play it. And sure enough, I get calls out of the blue from pianists from other parts of the, of the world saying, I heard you had a concert grand piano, a Yamaha C3. Can I play it? Can I come up and play your, play your venue? And, uh, and, and everybody who plays it uh, just, just drools over it. They just go, go Google eyed over it. It's really, it's a joy to see people come up and, and, and realize they're going to get to play a really wonderful instrument. So that's a great, great how part did, of the story. How did we get it in? We, it was out the back stairs, right? They you came up the back stairs. The legs off? A professional moving equipment. You take the legs off, you turn it up on its side and they put on a sled and they can slide it up the stairs. And it weighs about 800 pounds. And uh, it came in, because it was professionals, it came in relatively easily. Yeah. It, they made it look really easy. Probably not that easy, yeah. but they, they know what they're doing. Yeah. So, uh, so that brings us to, uh, so it, it, almost back to the, to the beginning of this, or to the, to the end of the story, which is uh, come May of this year, uh, we decided, we finally committed to putting together a series of shows. We've held 22 shows now. Every Thursday night, uh, with the exception of one Thursday, we had an artist last week who he and his, his uh, uh, band member had COVID, so they couldn't come to the show, which yes. I totally understand. I experienced that recently myself. It is no fun, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I, uh, I was really sorry to see that they couldn't play. They will be playing here again. They're, it was yeah. going to be an amazing show. I was so looking forward to it. Um, but they'll be back in the winter. They, they agreed to schedule another day with us. Nice. But we've had uh, 22 shows. Some of the most talented musicians that I've, that I've ever heard play live on a stage, every one of them has been an entirely absolute listening room. You can hear a pin drop in this building when the, when the music comes down to a low level. And, uh, and it's, it's been it surpassed all my expectations. The room has the right sound. It, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's almost church-like in the way the music resonates through the, through the room. Um, every single artist has, has more or less said that the, the sound is, is uh, if not perfection, close to it. Um, we still think there's a few little tweaks we could probably make to, to improve the sound, but I don't know that we're in any hurry to do it. We, we, every musician has been yeah. so happy with it. And it's the room is set up so well. It's interesting because it's it's not a big room, but big enough. And there's all these pillars around and things. And you'd think that it would be hard to to sit always in a good spot and not have your view blocked. But it's there isn't a bad seat in the house. No there matter isn't. where you're sitting, you can see really well the performers. And it's it is an intimate space. And 
you can fit what 55 seats is about what we do 50 to 55 is you can put the fire chief says we can seat 70 people up here i don't think it would be very comfortable with 70 no. people but it's um, fun i we've had some you know a few shows that are you know smaller attendance but if even if you have 15 people here it feels full enough but if you have 30 40 people it doesn't feel crowded which is had, i think that's been wonderful as well that as long as you get a few people in here it still feels it doesn't feel empty and yeah, it doesn't feel crowded yeah. if there are a bunch a, a, an audience of 20 25 people is a is a is a nice is a nice audience mm -hmm. and uh, uh we had when justin mckinney the comic played the stage we sold it out we had 55 seats yep. which by the way we're having justin mckinney back, the so. december 14th december 14th are tickets available for that yet not yet should be up tomorrow or the next day so great but uh we had 55 people seated in the room for that show and it was it was crowded but it was comfortable everybody yeah. everybody was was had their place and we had food and wine and everybody had a table to sit at or a place uh, a countertop mm -hmm. if not a table so uh I think ideally for the listening room, I, I think the, some of the best shows are going to be somewhere between 30 and 40 people. That's that a seems, nice, seems like good nice yeah. size. Yeah. And that's kind of what we, we targeted. Uh, we, we will consider this a success if we're getting between 30 and 40 people a show. We're still not there yet. Uh, we need to get the word out there. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're not selling enough tickets to, to justify the, the show yet, but we knew that would be the case. We yeah, can't open time. a brand new venue and just expect everybody in the world is going to know you're there all of a sudden. Um, we don't have a big advertising budget, so we can't you know, advertise around the world what we're doing. So, so uh, it takes a little time to build the audience, and that's happening. We're selling yeah. more tickets with each show. And it depends, too, I think, on the, the artists performing. Some of them will promote their own show a little bit more, yep. or just based on who they are, where they are, they might have more of a local following. I think, actually, our best, maybe not our best show, one of our most well-attended shows um, was so full because it wasn't even the main act. It was the... The opener. We had a, a very a young piano player. Yes. Um, he must have been, I don't know, maybe college age. Twenty one. He, yeah. he was in college, yeah, or uh, just out of college. I think two thirds of the audience was his parents and aunts and uncles and their friends and he, he filled the room and that, that was great. It was a it was a wonderful show. And they all, you know, stuck around of course for the main act as well, but it, it yeah, was fun. That it, was, that was sort of, good. it was a fun the, thing finding out. The yeah. other big show, the, the ballroom thieves were that yes. was probably our biggest ticket sales uh, for the music venue series, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, uh, and I hope to have them back. That was okay. a great show. Yeah, we've already we're having a few repeat performers already. We've got um, yep. Ligari's guy. coming back. I saw, and uh, we are doing our, I think already maybe our best selling one, especially in pre sales. We've got um, already thirty something tickets sold for um, the Christmas one with Charlie Brown Christmas. Yes, with. Um, Heather, Heather, Heather Pearson. Uh, Pearson. Yeah. If you if you want to see that show, uh, get your tickets because I think we're that one will we're this close to sold out, out yeah. of that show already. I think we're up almost to forty tickets sold. So yeah. That's coming up in uh, December. Yep. But it's going to be a great of, show. They've all been such great shows. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's the the listening room. Now I, I did I did go into a lot more depth. I'm not going to spend much time on it now. But if you read the story, you're going to go all the way back to when I was four or five years old. And my parents took me to a, uh, I don't know if you, anybody listened to bluegrass out there. There's a, a world famous bluegrass festival called Bean Blossom. That's not one I know. It's in Indiana. It's one of the largest bluegrass festivals in the world. And it was started by the father of bluegrass, the, the family that that's really credited with, uh, with really, I forget their names now. I, I, I feel terrible. Um, you'll, you'll read about it here, but, um, when I was four or five years old, barely old enough to really remember, my parents uh, a couple times took our family and we camped. And like a lot of like a lot oh, yeah. of bluegrass festivals, you often it's at a campground yep. and everybody camps. And after the festival is over at ten or eleven o'clock at night, all the musicians go to their campsites and, and play yeah. till the wee hours of the morning. And that that impressed upon me probably more than anything else, anything else in my life musically was that experience going from camp to camp, listening to banjo players and guitar players and just people so picking by the campfire and, and really accomplished musicians just hanging out together and jamming together. And I was young and obviously very impressionable. And although I can't tell you a lot of details about that, um, it inspired the hell out of me musically. 
I tried to take up the fiddle as a young <laughs> child. I wanted to learn to play the fiddle because of that experience. But sadly, at my rather underfunded school, they would only teach me classical violin. And after a couple of years of trying to learn classical violin, something that I had almost zero interest in, interest in, I really wanted to play the fiddle and nobody would teach it to me. So, uh, so I ended up giving up the instrument. I think to this day, it's probably for the best. I don't think I'm that musically talented. <laughs> so I took up the fiddle again when I was in my 30s and I thought I'd give it another try didn't go so well. I didn't have a lot of time. But. <laughs> so that was the most, one of the most influential times in my life. And I talk about that in, in our story. And, and there's a few other moments ah. along the way, and I'm not going to share them all with you. I'll let you read, the, read it for yourself. And we wouldn't have time anyway. So, um, but um, all the way up to when I met Ken and Chuck and uh, discovered that they had a musical interest uh, similar to mine. And uh, Ken, maybe even more so than me, uh, he's an audiophile. He's, oh, he's yeah. got a, a professional, almost professionally built stereo system at his house, and he collects albums. And, and uh, Chuck and I and Ken would, would just sit sometimes at his house listening to music and drinking wine and beer and, and uh, learning about or talking about Ken's music collection. And, and uh, he's turned me on to a whole bunch of music that I, that I wasn't familiar with. And... Chuck turned me on to the, the New York jazz scene. Uh, he's got a place in New York, and, and whenever we go to visit Chuck there, we, we go to some of the, some of the classic jazz clubs. Um, drawing a blank on the name, but I talk about it in my story a little bit. But um, all this was inspiration for really how we all came together to, to put this venue on. And if, if we have it our way, we're going to be putting performances on this stage for the rest of our lives that would be really what i would like to see happen if we can if we can convince enough people to get tickets and and keep showing up for the show then we'll Great. keep putting the show on yeah we can do different things you know we have sort of the weekly series but we can do special events with other things and different types of groups and things like that or um mentioning the records um you have a you have a plan for for record player up here, don't you? Yes, that's, that's a fun I'm thing. Glad you brought that up. a little bit. So, uh, a, a music friend in Meredith donated their their rather nice turntable to us. Um, a uh, a gentleman who who actually a, applied for a job here, and I got to know a little bit. Um, he's he's not working here, but um, he offered me the idea that he had at a restaurant he worked at called BYOV. <laughs> Bring your own vinyl. So I'm doing some research now, and uh, we're trying to figure out a, a plan for having a vinyl night where you can come and put, bring your own collection, if you will, or maybe, uh, maybe we'll have a collection of ours here, and you'll get to uh, spin some records right here, and we'll play them over the speakers. That's for, yeah, that's, and, that uh, sounds like a lot of fun. And we want to make an educational opportunity. But one idea I've had, and we may do someday, is we do uh, 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 Monday night practice sessions where we have some top name bands come in here and practice. And the audience gets to observe, oh, not interact, fun. but to get to observe and see what practice looks like. I've been to some practice sessions and it's amazing. I learn more at those sessions than, than anything yeah. because you hear the musicians talk about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so that would be a nice educational opportunity and helpful. You know, we could invite uh, give reduced ticket pricing to, to students and people at, at the local high schools or, or Plymouth or uh, mm -hmm. musicians who are up and coming. Um, we are talking to Katie Dobbins. Uh, she used to do a, uh, a folk series, a live folk series. Oh, yeah. and, uh, I'm much she's, more into folk than folk and bluegrass than jazz. Yeah, so she's coming in and we're going to talk about maybe uh, coming up with a night here where, where we go live to Facebook and YouTube with some of the, the local up and coming folk artists, singer songwriters, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a talk show format, similar to this, um, something Katie's done in the past. Oh, I've, I've seen some cool, um, see you've shown me, there's, there's a venue down in Nashville that, I, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of venues like this down in Nashville, but there's one particular one, um, what's it called, the Song Suffragettes, and it's, you know, Nashville, so it's more country, but it's, you know, young female artists, and they'll have maybe four or five of them on yeah. any given night, and they'll play a new song that they're working on and talk about it. And talk a lot of it. the people that end up becoming, you know, country stars, they start at a place like that. 
and get sort of feedback from fellow we build supports. That. Yeah. We want to build that. And Katie, uh, that sounds, she, that would be wonderful. She's, she's contacted us about, about trying to sponsor something like that. And, and, uh, it might very well happen. Yeah. It looks like we've got some comments to catch up on. Sure. Um, Priscilla is, yeah, Priscilla is recommending Justin McKinney. She's seen him before. Um, she also recommends John Davidson, uh, says theater and sandwich is over for the season and he'd be a big draw. I don't know who I, I, a, I've reached out to John Davidson. He actually is he came, another comedian. No, no he's or, a he's a famous Hollywood uh, art actor and oh, musician, okay. and uh, he he was in Hollywood. He he hosted Hollywood Squares oh, okay. and a few other talk shows. And uh, Gary suggests a Monday night with Father Bob, or with Father Bob. Father Bob, who's that? Um, Priscilla also, yeah. Priscilla loves the bluegrass. Oh yeah, she talks about uh, this is what I was thinking of the bluegrass festivals. I've been to one that Priscilla mentions, um, the Osby Valley Music Festival over in Hiram, Maine. Um, I went to that several years in a row when I was working up north. And, you know, probably doesn't compare to the one that you were at out in Indiana, but it's a really nice music festival. Um, that, that, that one's been... been Actually, there. uh, there's one of the largest New England uh, bluegrass festivals is right north of here, every August uh, at the Branch Brook Campground, right, oh. right near Waterville Valley. Okay. Um, I've been to it a couple times. It's huge. They have a huge campground and uh, and very much uh, in the spirit of the what I remembered from Bean Blossom. Yeah. Uh, um, Matt recommends. He said Prince Edward Island musicians traveling to New York City and other cities, always looking for venues on Wednesday or Thursday en route. Uh, Gary would love some different nights of the week. That's true. Yeah, just having different things, different times. You know, it's that's what some do. people can't make Thursdays, so we, rotating we, around. If we can find the audience. And the, the time that audience wants to be here, we want to have music maybe seven nights a week someday. I mean, we've got piano on Friday. We've got piano on Saturday. I hope uh, if you haven't had the chance, I hope you get the chance to come and experience piano night. It's an exceptional yeah. night in and of itself because because of this great piano, we have some extremely talented piano players. Um, some of them are now singing. We've got a mic hooked up, so we're going to have some singing that happens on piano night as well. And uh so yeah, no, absolutely. We want to grow this into a music venue. It's what's what my heart and passion is is uh, all about, and that's how we got to be a winery because the three passionate guys that are interested in wine. We opened up a restaurant because of our passion for food. And we're opening up a music venue to add to the mix because of the same thing: passion for music. Do what you love, and you will never work another day in your life. It's absolutely true. So, uh, cheers to that. so we're going to do what we love. Yeah, cheers to that. Cheers to all of you. Um, well, let me take a, a moment and share with you, if you haven't seen, you probably many of you have, but I'm going to share just a few snippets of uh, some of the artists that have, have, uh, have played here. I'm going to share my screen real quick. And I have a preview window. There we go. Let's look at some pictures together. I'll, I'll just go through these real quickly. Um, this is just a collection. There's, there's uh, I don't know, about 30 pictures here of various artists that have played the stage. Um, many of these artists are uh, some of the most accomplished musicians in their field. Um, uh, many of them were, were or still are professors at, at Berkeley College. And, uh, and uh, not only are, are teaching young musicians today, but are at the top of their game at some of their, you know, in some of their talent. And uh, so these are just a cross section of some of the very talented. That's Chris Mega. Uh, Chris Mega is, uh, uh, he's, he's been our sort of secondhand man. He's, uh, I credit him with, with uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the groundwork, getting this venue off and running. He's an accomplished musician himself. He plays piano here on a regular basis. And he also helps do the sound engineering for the shows and sets up the stage and, um, I, we couldn't do this without Chris. No, he's been not. absolutely invaluable. And uh, so I, if he's watching, you know, thank you, Chris, uh, for, for being there for us. And, uh, and this is uh, Daniela Shatker. She was our second show back in May. Yep. Uh, really outstanding. She's a professor at Berkeley, uh, one of the most beautiful piano players. Um, here's a venue. This is a, a time when there was about 20 people or 25 people in the room. So you can see what it it looks like as a full room. I just, I just love the purple light. It's just, yeah. The purple is just yeah. such a good jazzy color. It just makes it, it looks fantastic when we get the lights on like that. Uh, she was with uh, Haas, Fred Haas. Uh, oh, yeah. She was the singer with Fred Haas. There's Fred playing sax. And uh, that's the Fred Haas trio. 
The Ballroom Thieves. Uh, that was their duo. The Ballroom Thieves, I believe they have three or four people in their band, but uh, they often play a duo. And being a smaller stage, they, they just came as a duo. But boy, that was one of the most beautiful shows that, uh, that we had. Yeah, it was really was amazing. Really right, These guys play all over the country. They play. They play yeah, uh, they've got, they're easily the, sort of the biggest name oh, yeah. that we've gotten. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, thanks to your connection. Yeah, I, I knew was, Martin uh, very well. Uh, Martin worked for me about uh, 12 years ago as a uh, embedded resorter at the Balsams Grand Resort Hotel. And we got to know each other for about three months and have stayed friends ever since. And uh, thankfully, he agreed to, to our show. And, he, and as part of the compensation for his show, uh, we, uh, uh, we supported his, his wedding. And he, uh, he, and his, he and his partner here got married a couple months ago. So it's really cool. And uh, here they are playing again. And Wingari Fahari, she was our first show. She played in early May, and that was she's such a gonna wonderful be wonderful launch. It was. She was just such a. She was just so so warm. She like so walked joyous. right in and like gave us all hugs and was just. She was just so full of joy. Yeah, yeah. and she's the whole show. Yeah, she's uh, she's from Kenya, and she so she brought this really nice world music uh, to the stage that was just yeah. just joyous to to hear. So you get to see her again. She's coming. I hope you get to yeah, see her. Say, she's uh, coming in December. December? I think late December. I think yeah, December 29th or something year, like yeah. that. And uh, and then uh, Yamika Peterson also. You could see I her. Miss, I missed that one. She plays locally. She plays a lot of clubs. but And I've seen her play clubs. Loud clubs. Not listening room experiences. And, and I enjoy watching her at those club experiences for sure. But I never enjoyed watching her play and perform more than I did when she was here because it was a listening room. And it was, she even said it was absolutely profound for her because she doesn't get the opportunity to play. There aren't very many listening rooms in the world and she plays them very, very seldom, if ever. And, uh, and she said it was really one of, her, one of her best experiences, which harkens back to my story from Saturday. I had 32 people in the room and they were all here to hear the story and I was here to tell it. And combined our energy and we created something special because of it and that's what i think yamika experienced and uh, and i know you know she was here with paul costley's plays all over new hampshire and um and i forget the other gentleman's name but um these are these are uh, lo very much local musicians local new hampshire musicians that are very talented been playing around for 30 or 40 years in this part of the world and uh and uh, bass guitar player uh, oh yoran israel he's coming back in a couple weeks actually Great. he's coming back with another artist he was the headliner for this show it was him and his band and uh, but he's coming back for a, a, a jazz sax player who's going to uh i believe he's a sax player I, I have to look but um he'll be the drummer for that trio and he was brilliant he was just absolutely brilliant, and such a joy per he was smiling the whole time <laughs> he was on stage it was just such a joy to watch him perform because you just knew he was having the time of his life. Yeah, yeah having a great time. Yeah, and uh, um, great piano player. Uh, he, he's played here a couple times already. Uh, he headlined one of the shows. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. So that's, that's a good example, cross-section, of, uh, of some of the folks who, who played. And let me share with you, I think I can do this. Bear with me if I can't, but I, I, uh, I have a little snippet of video that oh, yeah. if... So let's see if we can get to see this. Uh, let's see if we can hear it. Video file. No, I don't want to do I that. I think if you do share screen, you had it pulled up. Yep. I think it was one of your windows open, wasn't it? Right, but the only thing is, oh, share tab audio. Great. Uh, is it one of these? No, this is a tab. It was another. Wasn't it on this, I think? Yes, yeah, here it is. Yeah. But I don't know if you'll be able to hear. Let's see. Do you think people can hear? Maybe if you go to. Let us know if you can hear it. Are you, are you at the bottom? Is everybody hearing this out there? Let us know. They might not be able to hear us. Yeah. Type in. Oh, yes, we can. Wonderful. Oh, fantastic. Great. So this uh, this was a performance Which, by... I need the other video. A bit quiet, but decent. 
What are you looking for? The, how do you get to your other windows? Oh, there I see it actually. There, there we go. Oh yeah, this guy was cool. Well, let's, uh, yeah, I'll talk about it. Let's go back to the other screen so we can see what people are saying. So the, uh, this was a performance, David, David uh, Kabrinsky, one of the most amazing people. Um, I absolutely love this man. He's just such a talented person, such a joyous person, such a, a warm and, and uh, kind person. It's just, I can't say enough about him. Every time I've ever met him, I just, I just feel so, so, uh, so connected with him and, and he with me and, and he with the people around him. He's just such a special person. And he spent 20 years uh, studying music and other things in, in uh, Africa. And he learned how to make African instruments. He learned how to play African music. Um, among a lot of other things he had, that made art, him, he had books. He's written. He's a writer. He's published. written books. And he had done a lot of beautiful art. He's from an those artist. As well. He draws. He paints. He's just such a talented person. And he put together this this group. Uh, I I did not know the pianist uh, of this group. But I was so blown away by his performance. And the drummer. Uh, I've seen many times. He's part of. He, he plays with John Lorenz uh, in his jazz trio a lot, and uh, and is one of the best jazz drummers. He's a professor at Plymouth State University, and he teaches drumming. Um, but this this show was, I think, probably uh, is up there with one of my all time favorites. It was so beautiful, and uh, and the music was so tender and so. Oh, I just I just love it. I, I play this. Uh, we, we record the soundtracks of, of these shows and I played them at my at my home. It's uh, let's stop the sharing because I don't know how if it's distracting yeah. to people. Just pretty bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. And let's, let's turn the music off. So, so I'm actually if you want to hear that show, I got permission. We, we had a videographer here videoing that show and we do a professional recording of all of the, the shows that we do and um, I got permission to put that video up on YouTube and we're going to post it on our website because it's such a beautiful show you you all have to see it you absolutely have to see it if you, you can't see it here live next best thing you should you should watch the show on, on YouTube but if he comes back and I guarantee you he will we've already talked to him about it and he's excited about it uh, he'll be back. Don't miss the show. It's it, you'll, it'll be one of your one of your favorites, I'm sure. It's just such beautiful music. Um, and uh, uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, we've got a couple of recordings. I, I don't know which. I'm, I'm going to reach out to the artists and see if they'll let us post. And the other thing we're going to do, I don't know if I told you this, but we're putting together. Uh, we've recorded every show that's played here. We got 22 shows. Not all of them are perfect, but many of them are really really well recorded and. Chris is going to assemble those into an eight hour collection of music played oh, in the wow. loft. And we're going to set it up so that we can play on some days, we can play eight hours of music okay. performed here. Cool. And people will be able to, to uh, people having lunch here will be able to listen to the music that was actually performed in this venue. Cool. And we'll put on our, on our specials page on the back mm -hmm. where we're going to list our artists we can put on the specials page uh, the music you're listening to today oh, yeah. was performed live on our stage Very at cool. the loft. So it's really cool. And uh, so far, every that. musician I've asked for permission to, to do that, they've given permission for it. That's fun. Um, it provides great opportunities for people to, to, to hear beautiful music and to learn more about our loft series. So, well, we should, we're at 630, so uh, we should probably give some closing details about um, you can upcoming find shows. yeah, so you can find a list of upcoming shows if you just go to our website and click on the the loft tab, right? Or events. It's the loft. No, you can go to events too, but if you want to just hear about the listening room, the yeah. loft is the ticket to go to because it just all all the shows all the are nights and all that are listed. Shows. So let let me just give you a couple quickies. Uh, just uh, the the this coming Thursday. Yeah is Anik and Nico Gallo, uh, Jason Anik and Nico Gallo duo. Uh, I can't wait to hear these. You've got a vibrapho vibraphonist, um, which I didn't even know what a vibraphone was until we had a vibraphonist yeah. play a few, sort of like a few months ago. It's like a xylophone. Quite, I feel like people know those a little more. It's a little more elaborate yeah. than a xylophone. And uh, 
and then a, a violinist, which I'm so excited about. That's my instrument, violins. I love mm -hmm. violins. Uh, any kind of music played on a violin is beautiful. So Jason Anik is, a, is considered a virtuoso violin player, and uh, there'll be a bass player here as well. Um, that's going to be a great show. I can pretty much guarantee it. I have no idea. I've never heard them play before, but, but be everything I know about them, they're, they're going to be amazing. Uh, and then the following uh, November 3rd, this should be an interesting show. For those oh, of you yeah. not interested in jazz, this is going to be an evening of songs and stories. Yeah, I'm intrigued by that. Yes. So we're going to have a storyteller here. They're going to play guitar and they're going to, uh, they're from rural Vermont and they're going to play some uh, beautiful music and, uh, and tell some, some stories. I'm really excited. And that's uh, Chris Gruen is mm -hmm. his name. Yeah. And, uh, and then we're, we have... One we have a off. very special event. We're not going to be holding a Thursday event on, uh, on, on November 10th. One of our former employees is getting married, and they requested over a year and a half ago to have that night for, for a rehearsal, a dinner, rehearsal yeah. dinner for their family. And, uh, and we love Abby. She's, uh, she's studying to be a doctor over in Maine right now. She's getting married soon, and uh, we're so excited to have her family here. So they picked that Thursday night, so we... We gave yeah, it up. I think they had picked that before they we picked even it before started, we the, even series, started so the music venue. They got the exception. <laughs> and then the following week, November 17th, we got uh, yeah, a modern jazz, and it's uh, Laszlo Gordonet. He's the he's put on the trio, and that's the one that Yoran is going to be coming back for. And John Lockwood, who's one of the, the most prolific uh, stand-up bass players in New England. He plays with lots of bands all over New England. He'll be the, he'll be the bass player that night. Uh, and then uh, following December 1st, Another, I don't know anything about this group. It's called <laughs> Meta Beat. Um, again, swinging 60s. We're breaking away from the jazz a yeah. little bit here. We're going to have some swinging 60s if you want to uh, hear this. Six, six band members will be coming to the stage. They're going to play the Beatles. They're going to put a jazz twist on it, but it is going to be some, some more uh, familiar pop music of the 60s. And then December 8th, anybody heard of this group? Uh, it's a group called Trade. Again. Oh, yeah, sure. They're from New Hampshire, and they're indie not... Indie rock sensation. Indie rock sensation, so it's not That's, jazz. Yeah. So we're going to break away from the jazz a little bit again. I feel like jazz sort of seems right for the, the listening room vibe. I think that's probably what a lot of the listening room performances are. It, it does definitely lend itself well to that sort of performance. Although, but other stuff is... Look at Yumika Peterson. Yeah. Different, she different was R&B. Yeah. Different stuff is, is good. And I, I'm excited for different things, being yeah. not as much of a jazz fan. There you go. That and then uh, December 15th, the Charlie Brown Christmas. It's going to be sold out. You better hurry if you're going to go to that because it's, it's, it's Wingari's definitely going to be sold out. It's Wingari's exciting that we're, we're booked so far out. We'll yeah, Wingari and then uh, Chiron, Benny Sharoni Quartet. I uh, don't know much about him. That's uh, December 29th. And then our last gig that's currently on the calendar is uh, Mika's Groove Train. That's Yumika Peterson. She's coming back again, and uh, she's bringing a different set of artists. So it's a Groove Train artist. We're gonna have some that some fun. some funk and some blues. It's gonna be really a fun night. So that's that's till December fifth. I hope you can make one of our shows. Um, he please help us spread the word. We really need a we need to uh, build our build our audience a bit here in order to have this uh, series be a success. We're debating now if we if we can't sell enough tickets, uh, we may have to go to two shows a month instead of one instead of four for the winter. But um, you guys let us know if, if, uh, if, if we get enough people to come and come to these shows, we'll, we'll keep putting them on. So you can um, get, yeah, tickets. So there are links on our website to our Eventbrite page. So you can get tickets easily there. Um, and there are usually still tickets available at the door, but of course buying them in advance is preferred. So you can yeah. buy your seat and we can know how many people to expect and exactly. make sure we're prepared. And, for and there's an advantage to buying in advance. We only have, we only have 35 seats at tables. And then the remaining seats are bar seats, which, in my opinion, it's perfectly fine for me. They're great seats, but not everybody likes to, yeah. to be at a high high chair on, at a bar. Especially if you're coming with you know a group of a you know, group. four people, you want to all be sitting at a table together and and not sort of spread out in a line. So if you buy tickets in advance online, you do get to choose your seats. Yes, and so you, you're is, likely going to get a table if yeah. you wait till the night of. The odds are you're going to probably have a bar top, mm -hmm. uh, especially as, it, as as shows get more popular. So uh, again, there's nothing wrong with a bar top. Uh, it's it's perfectly fine, but again, some people prefer a table. So. Um, so I think that's it. If you haven't seen this, if you're not in the club, don't worry about it. We have these in the tasting room. Come get one. You, you're going to read all about it. If you're in the club, you're going to get one of these in your club pickup if you haven't already. And you can read the full story. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll do some future shows. We're going to have Chris Miga on one of these days to, to uh, talk about his piano playing. And, uh, but anyway, 
Thank you all for joining us for another Monday night. I hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll look forward to seeing you next Monday for... Halloween. Halloween. Oh, that's going to be a fun show. We're going to go live from the porch of Hermit Woods. We're going to have over 300 <laughs> kids come, and uh, we're going to interview some of the families, and we're going we're gonna to pass out hundreds of pounds of candy, and, and it's maybe, a blast. Maybe something extra special for the, for the parents. Yeah, and always something special for the parents who come trick-or-treating at Hermit Woods. So it's going to be a great night. It'll be a lot of fun. We're going to see some great costumes, and we'll be live from the porch of Hermit Woods Winery next Monday at 530. We'll see you then. Have a great Cheers. evening, everybody.